It is Wednesday afternoon, May 27th, and we are privileged to have a study in uh, the book of Yeshua, Isaiah, chapter 40. This is also known as a, a chapter that speaks to the comfort for Israel, but I'll give you a hint, even though many of you will say, well, I'm not Israel, what does that have to do with me? Everything because we can draw the principles, we can ap uh, apply it to our lives and glean much from it. Um, let me bring to you uh, just a tiny, tiny bit of background on Isaiah. His uh, ministry was in a, approximately the 740s BC. So we're talking 8th century, we're talking way back, this is even before Daniel, Daniel was on the scene. Uh, his name means the Lord saves or Jehovah's salvation. Great name. I love that name. Contemporaries for Yeshia or Isaiah. Uh, Yeshia is a little closer to the Hebrew pronunciation. Uh, contemporaries are Hosea, Amos, Amos, and Micha, Micah. So this is the time period that he's in. King Hezekiah's ruling and also goes into the time of Uzziah. The Assyrian Empire is rising up and expanding and Israel is declining. Why is Israel declining? She's been warned. It's her sin. Um, we're speaking now specifically of Judah. Um, the two southern tribes are, we're going to be speaking of especially that uh, her sin is going to bring her into captivity in Babylon. The ten northern are going to go into captivity or may have already, depending on when we're talking, by Assyria. Assyria is as I said, is rising, but then Babylon's going to rise up and swallow Assyria. Babylon's going to take the two southern into captivity because even though they watched their ten brothers go into captivity for idolatry and rebelliousness against uh, the law of God, we're going to see that, that uh, southern Israel does the same thing, the two southern tribes known as Judah. Now, we know that captivity comes about 586 B.C., uh, it starts a little before, but that's the, the date that's mainly known for it. So you can see we've got a little bit of time building toward it, but God speaks prophetically. That means telling us the future. It's also spoken proleptically. That means it's spoken as if it has already happened. It's so sure, it's such a fact, that it, it's spoken as if it's past tense, in other words. And we'll see much of that in this chapter as we're going through it. In the book of Isaiah, throughout the book, the 66 chapters, we hear much about God's judgment, but we also hear much about God's salvation. Remember, that's even what the name means. We hear uh, God referred to as the Holy One of Israel. Now, one interesting sidelight is a lot of people want to divide the book Chapters 1 through 39 being one part, chapters 40 through 66 being another part. And some try to say, oh, this is two different authors, it couldn't be the same. Well, if it is two different authors, then how come on both halves of the book we find God especially referred to as the Holy One of Israel? A name that, that outside of the book of Isaiah is only six other times in our entire uh, Bible, from Bereshit to Revelation. But in, um, in the book of Isaiah, it is, I have to add real quickly, it's 26 times, 12 in the first half, 14 in the second half. I tend to think that's one proof, one proof alone that's showing us one author, that this is a theme that runs through. And just because they try to pick out differences does not mean anything. We write at different times with a different feel, a different way of looking at something. It does not have to disqualify. We aren't carbon copies of ourselves, always, always doing exactly the same. But to refer to his name in that way, and it being so heavily an Isaiah uh, thumbprint, I think that, that we have a, a key there. That's just thrown in for free. Hope that blesses you if you've ever wondered or if you come up against that argument that Isaiah couldn't have written Isaiah. I think if God put his name on the book, he's the one that God used to write that book. And remember, it's all by inspiration of our God. So back on track, we're referring, referring to the time now that even though Jerusalem, Jerusalem is going to be facing the deportation of her people, Yeshua has his gaze fixed on a divine event further out. He, this event is the consummation of Israel's redemption. 
He's going to speak to their judgment. He's going to speak to their captivity, but he never leaves it there. He brings out very clearly that he is looking for the full redemption of Israel. He is looking so far that he's looking down to the second coming and the millennial reign of Messiah. And we know that will be fulfilled. That's our prophecy still to be fulfilled, but again, it's spoken of collectively as if it is a fact already happened. It is a fact. It just hasn't already happened, but it will. Now, why am I saying all of this? Let me bring out one more quick note, and then I'll explain why this is so important. Verse 1, you'll notice my people very quickly in the verse. Now, we're going to go back. We're going to take, you know, we're going to start with the first word. No worries. But I just want you to see that, uh, and well, <laughs> I'm trying to hurry. Verse 1 tells us who's speaking also. Tells us God's the one speaking. And he's calling certain people my people. In verse 9, he refers to himself as your God. So this God who is speaking is calling a people his people, and he's telling those people, I am your God. Now, that, to me, take that to the bank. If God says, I'm your God, and you are my people, he is your God, and you are his people. In that is absolutely no room for replacement theology. Remember, this is not a time that the people are, are behaving well. They are a rebellious, ornery people, children, that need to be brought back in the line. But nowhere do we read of God saying, I'm done. Nowhere do we read that God says, I'm going to give all your promises to someone else now. We see his loving them through it. Correcting them? Oh, yes. Calling them out? Oh, yes. But loving them and bringing them through. This is a great argument against those. And if you don't know what replacement theology says, it basically says because the Jewish people denied Messiah when he came the first time, God's done with the Jew. He's raised up a new people. It's called the church. They replace Israel, they get all of Israel's blessings, and they move forward in those blessings, no matter what. Now, number one, is the church doing any better at being obedient than Israel? Not hardly, not as a whole. We've got Laodicea alive and well in this world today. Shame on them. They need to wake up, they need to get straightened out, and they need to become the church of Philadelphia. That is the remnant that God is pleased with. And God always has a remnant all through time. But you will never read in Scripture where God replaces Israel, where he takes promises that he made unconditionally, and he made with the word forever, took them away and gave them to another people, and then allow those people to be however they want, and they get to keep those promises. And oh, by the way, why didn't the curses come along for disobedience? It's a package deal. You don't get to pick and choose. And we know none of this is true, that God does not come... Come. Okay, what's the word I want? He doesn't pull back on his promises, on his word. If he did to Israel, we as his people today, and not replacing Israel, but his people also, because we are brought in, we're all grafted in together, Jew and Gentile, when in Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, into the root that is Yeshua, Jesus. If he could take away promises that, that he used unconditional words with and forever words with from Israel, then he could do that from this body called Christ, this assembly, this called out assembly, this church also. That would leave me shaking in my boots because, again, I don't see the church living up to what it's supposed to be doing either. I don't see it fulfilling really any better than I see Israel. But, uh, again, no fear, no worries, because my God is a faithful God. If he says it, he will do it. Will he do it in your time? Will he do it in my time? Is he to be on our leash, and we pull and say when or how? No, never. That is left in God's hands, in his hands alone. And that's why he says, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But again, he's a God who follows through. He's a God who is faithful. He is a God who is going to tell our rebellious people, basically, you have to be punished for what you have done, what you are doing, but I'm going to keep my hand there, I'm going to see you through it, I'm going to bring you back, and I'm going to be able to bless you and your land because you'll finally have that right spirit toward me. 
So keep that in mind because remember this is a, a chapter of comfort, not a chapter of judgment, but a chapter, well, it shows some judgment in it, but this is a, a it starts out, comfort ye, or excuse me, let me give it to you actually, comfort, oh comfort my people. It's said twice in our complete Jewish Bible, it says comfort and keep comforting, continual. But there are those who even believe that it was spoken twice because it was in relation to the temple being destroyed twice, the first temple and the second temple being destroyed, that, that God again was looking ahead and speaking comfort to the people. And why would the temple be, the, the um, destruction temple be so crushing to the Jewish person? Because that's where they met God. Remember, they didn't have the individuality of the Holy Spirit dwelling within as we do. They went to the tabernacle first and saw that there was a place called the Holy of Holies where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt. Then they feel, finally are able to build the temple in their land as a permanent, the, the tabernacle being a tent that moved. Now they have the tabernacle, and they see and they hear, especially we read of it in, in Hezekiel, of the Shekinah glory of God filling the temple. This was the place that they were to go to worship God, to be in line to God, to keep obedient to his commandments. So the loss of the temple was devastating. It was traumatic, and I'm putting it lightly. I need stronger words. But here, the Hebrew word nacham, to console oneself, these are words to comfort these people. That comfort is dependent on obedience to his command. He's the one that is talking. He's talking, notice, second person, plural. So he's addressing this to more than one person. He didn't say, Yeshaya, comfort yourself. He said, my people, comfort yourself. More than one is to receive this comfort that God is freely giving. It's the very same word in Psalm 23 and verse 4. And that word, in, that, in Psalm, Tehillim, Psalm 23 and verse 4, we read, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And if you study the shepherd in the life, the rod and the staff were not for beating. It wasn't a rod to beat. It was a protection. It was, there's so much that was done with the rod and the staff to help the sheep, that they were a comfort to him, nacham to him, to the sheep. Yeah, let's go a little deeper because I love when we get into the root of words. And when we go into the original root of this word, nacham, in English, if you're trying to write it down, N as in Nancy, N A C H A M. Okay, and M as in mother. <laughs> okay, nacham. Um, I have to realize I don't have a whiteboard behind me to write on. I didn't ask Roger for that, and I think we're okay with that. It. But when you get into the Hebrew root, the idea seems to be uh, reflecting, breathing deeply. It's usually a physical display of one's feeling, usually in relation to sorrow, compassion or comfort, that heaviness, that sighing, that, that sigh of deep relief when God meets you in that place, when his comfort is there. And this passage is a proclamation that God's word is what's going to bring the comfort. Now, we, how we can apply this is we need to be under the Word of God. We need to be under the preaching of the Word of God. We need to be hearing the teaching of the Word of God. We need to be hearing the Word of God. We need to be reading the Word of God. We need to be interacting with the Word of God if we want to experience His comfort. We will spend time everywhere else and look everywhere else and then get upset at God for not delivering. Well, hello? If you're not willing to get yourself under his counsel, where you can hear, where you can be taught, where it, it can be absorbed into your mind and you, the very fiber of your being, then you are going to miss out on his comfort. But if that's where you are, if there's a time of need and you rush into his presence, you get your Bible, you open it up, you look for comfort in it, you pray, you cry your heart out to your God and you keep your ear open to hear him, I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. I guarantee you, he will meet you there. The nature, the character of God's word, it's God-breathed, it doesn't have error, it's profitable for instruction, for a correction, it equips you for life, it is alive, it is powerful, 
It is sharper than a two-edged sword, which we're told penetrates to the very recesses of, of man's heart. It is able to bring forth life. And then it doesn't just bring forth life, it brings forth abundant life. This is life on steroids. This is a good life. It's hope. It is help in time of need. You heard me in opening prayer cry out for the needs of those who are walking through very deep waters. They have serious life-threatening issues, and yet we can have hope for them because we can cry out to this God. And he has promised that he will help in time of need. Look at verse 4 just real quickly. Again, we're going to come back up to verse 1, but it says, Let every valley be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low. Let the rough ground become a plain, the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. He's saying when there is devastation, the mountains are crashing down, the valleys are erupting, the, 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 what was plain is now rough. He doesn't say throw in the towel, get discouraged, give up, there is no hope. No, that's where he says, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Great need means great time to see God's hand at work in behalf of that need. And we do know that if we back up to verse 3, that there's a voice crying this out, calling out in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. Now we know, because we have the advantage of looking back, that this is referring to one who would come called Yochanan the Mercer, and he, that's John the Baptist. And he would come in the spirit of Eliyahu, the spirit of Elijah. We know that, that these were promises made, and here is again proof of fulfillment. John the Baptist came and fulfilled if they would have been open to that fulfillment. Elijah will come before that great and terrible day, actually in that great and terrible day, and fulfill as what has been promised. But what I'm point, pointing out to you is you have a choice. God's help or man's fallenness, man's vain imaginations, man's own strategies. How does man try to help with their problems? Well, they turn to alcohol. They turn to drugs. Let me just numb myself for a while. They turn to someone with power and hope to wield that power in their direction. They rely on their possessions, their riches, their what's within their reach. And do they find the satisfaction, the health, and the wholeness that I'm referring to? We know they don't. When the numbness wears off, the problem's greater, not worse, uh, not better. We know that these things are not the answer. But notice there's a key, and we get that key right here in the very first verse. When it says, comfort, oh, comfort my people. How, what's, what's the key here? Says, your God. For thus says the Lord, if the Lord says it, there's your value, there's your hope, there's your help. And I'll give you a little key. He whose Bible is falling apart isn't. If you're in your Bible so much, you're wearing your Bible out, you're going to be strong in the Lord and you won't fall apart. The Bible may, but you won't. So comfort my people. Now, what people is he referring to originally in context? Who is Yeshia writing to? Is Yeshia, Isaiah, writing to the church? No. The church hasn't even been heard of yet. Remember, we're about seven, in round figure 750 B.C. The church doesn't start until in round figures 40 A.D. So we are talking almost 800 years difference before this assembly is called the church, the called out assembly, that we are a part of today when we put our faith in the Lord. But God had a special people who he covenanted with. That people came through Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the forefathers of our faith. When God made covenant with them, he made a covenant promise with what is called Israel today. We know out of Jacob comes the 12 tribes. Out of the word Judah comes the word Jew. We know that this was uh, in, Isra in Isaac's time called the Israelites. We know this is the Hebrew people, the ones who crossed over from idolatry into worshiping the one true and living God. And God covenanted in a very special way. And he promised that covenant, passed it down, and he gave it to this people. He gave it to the, re the, the, recipient, the recipients of God's promises. 
would be to the nation of Israel through their Messiah. It's through Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, that they receive this comfort, that they receive the promises that they are putting their faith in. When Abraham was shown the day of the Lord's coming through through the gospel being relayed to him and the stars, the, the roadmap that God had laid out, we know that it was accounted to him for righteousness. That means he put his faith in what God was saying. And he would consider God's people then. And we know that that's who these promises were made to, that we know again, we can glean from this and learn from it and apply to ourselves in a way that brings us comfort also. Because again, as I said, we are God's people today also. And so we have that assurance that what God is giving to us, he will fulfill in us also. He is not a God who only cared about the Jewish people or only about the land of Israel. He chose to put his name on the land of Israel, literally, geographically, Yerushalayim even it has in it his name. But we also know that God was saying, Israel, I'm raising you up to be a kingdom of priests to take this message to the entire world. Remember, for God so loved the world. He never left out the rest of the world. He uses Israel to be his people to work through. And that was what they were to be doing. So again, even though Isaiah is talking to Israel, and this is for us 2,800 years ago approximately, it still has validity for us today in our lives. Notice this God who is telling his people to be comforted. He says, speak tenderly or speak kindly to Yerushalayim. What, he, what it literally says from the Hebrew is to speak upon the heart. The heart being tender. The heart being love. So with a heart of love, he's saying speak to Yerushalayim. I know she's a rebellious people and I know she's going to suffer in captivity. I know that she's in trouble. I know she's going to the woodshed. But speak to her with a tenderness and a love. This is an emphasis on the personal communication that, that was there between God and his people. Um, if you're not close to God, you can't hear that tender voice. But if you are, you know what I'm speaking about, and you know that God's comfort, his, I'm sorry, his voice speaks comfort and assurance to us. It reminds us of his everlasting love. Remember, we're going to use this word, we're going to see he's speaking to Israel forever. Not for only in the 800 BCs, not only for in the 40 ADs, but for 2020 in the midst of a pandemic. He's speaking again through this. We see his sovereign control. We see his infinite wisdom. And we can realize if God told the children of Israel repeatedly, be obedient to my word. Don't be just hearers, but be doers of my word that blessings might follow you. Well, I think we can take that formula and apply that to ourselves. Let us be hearers of the word, but not just hearers. Let us get up and do his word, and we will see blessing follow. In that speaking tenderly, in that, that communication line that's going back and forth, we see call out to her, cry out to her. This is a strong, clear proclamation. Even though it's spoken tenderly and in love, there's nothing wimpy about it. This is strength. This is a, a, a cord that cannot be broken. It's called love. Now, these two verses are going to look proleptically now. We're going to see, again, they're anticipating the future as if it already exists. And why can they do that? Because we're speaking about the sovereignty of our God. He is sovereign. Nothing thwarts his plan. Nothing puts him into plan B. Nothing makes him get up and pace back and forth in front of the throne. Nothing surprised him or caught him off guard. He is in control and he always has been and he always would be. So when we look at these verses, we're going to see a message of comfort on three levels. We're going to see that her warfare has ended. We're going to see her iniquity is pardoned. And we're going to see that she has received double from the Lord's hand for all her sins. Now that phrase might scare you and you might think, uh-oh, I don't want to receive double from the Lord for my sins. Well, let's read it in order and we'll find out what that means as soon as we get to that phrase. But these were three areas of comfort that Israel needed to hear. 
you may be in a place where you need to hear that kind of comfort. So let's uh, read about it. Let's take it line by line. Call out to her. Cry out to her. Let her hear the compassion, tenderness, the, the love in the voice. Tell her, number one, her warfare has ended. That's telling her there's going to be an end to the Babylonian captivity. It will not be forever. You will not be cast out of the land forever. There is a restoration in view. There is a fulfillment of those promises that she's going to lack the benefit of right now, but there's going to be a fulfillment. Now, we know that there was a near fulfillment that after the Babylonian captivity, the children of Israel did return to their land, but we know it didn't end there. The cycle gets repeated, and we can look proleptically all the way to the tribulation time when they're going to need to hear the tender voice of the Lord crying out to them because they're going to be in a world of hurt, literally, but they're going to have in view the end of the tribulation and the coming of the kingdom to Israel, where they're going to see the nation brought back to God. They're going to see God as a covenant-keeping God. He will fulfill all his promises. So they're looking all the way down now and seeing that at this time, that warfare that's ended, and I'm taking you all the way to that second coming, is also the time when you see her iniquity pardoned. Her sins have been forgiven on the basis of the redemptive work of Messiah Yeshua Jesus. We see him um, in, in form in Isaiah, Yeshua chapter 53. Isaiah is building toward this, that wonderful chapter that shows him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb that went before the shears silent willingly gave his life that he might redeem many. We see that that is the fulfillment. We see that iniquity can only be pardoned on the basis of the redemptive work of Messiah, of, of the, the, our Savior, Israel's Savior, our Savior also. But it is true, and it will be. That will be the day when he returns. He says, I will not come until I hear them saying, Baruch Hababa Shem Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When they finally realize and cry out to their God, the same way they did in Egypt, they cried out. God heard their cry and raised them up Moshe. Well, he's going to raise them up the one greater than Moshe. The one who comes like Moshe, but the one who God said will be the greater prophet. When he comes, hear him. This is the one who's coming again. This is the fulfillment. This one, at this time, at the second coming, there will be an end to idolatry. There will be an end to this rebellion. There will be an end to corruption. It will all be put away with. It will all be removed, and it will be seen as this is saying it's already happened. Notice it doesn't say her iniquity will be removed. It's saying it has been removed. Again, looking forward to that day as if it's already happened. Then we come to that phrase that she's received double for all her sins from the Lord's hand. When it's done in this phrasing, it's an idiomatic phrase. That means that we take it metamorphically, and the idea is that everything that is necessary to accomplish the job, it's done. The job is well done. There's not little pieces missing. There's not, an, oops, this has got to be taken care of. We would say today, every I was dotted, every T was crossed. God is saying, take it to the bank. There's nothing that's going to come back to haunt you or, or need, need straightening out or fixing. It's all been completed. I take you to Messiah's words on the cross. His last word, I believe, on the cross. Tetelestai in the Greek, in our English, it is finished. Period. He didn't say, it is finished, now you pick up and do this. He didn't say, this is finished, but something's left undone. He said, it is complete, whole, finished, done. Back in the day when that was written, it was what was stamped on a bill that today we say paid in full. If you have a receipt that says paid in full, nobody can come and tell you you have to pay more for whatever that was. It's been done. That's what the Lord is saying here. Your sins have been redeemed. Your past, your present, your future, 
on the basis of the shed blood of Yeshua, that is what is meant here. The job is done. Now, keep in mind, Isaiah is speaking to people that need God's comfort because they're being told, you're going off into exile. How would you like to have a prophet speaking for God say to you today, get ready, you're going to have to leave your home, you're going to have to leave everything that's familiar, you're going to be marched down as slaves into a land that is not your own, that's full of idolatry, you're going to have to settle down there, you're going to have to raise your families there, you're going to have to live there, you're going to be out of your land for 70 years. And then we see that it happens again in the time of Rome, when Titus destroys Jerusalem, any Jewish person found in Jerusalem is a dead Jew, and they're scattered. And that happened to the Jewish people for almost 2,000 years before they came back into the land in 1948. Yet here is God's faithfulness, because even in that, never a people has been out of their land as long as the Jew and remained a people. When the Bible says there are signs for the world to know, the Jew is a sign for the world to know. How did the Jew remain a Jew in captivity for almost 2,000 years out of her land? Because God kept her hand, his hand on her and he brought a remnant through. That's the faithfulness of our God. That's the comfort. That's what we're talking about. And as these Jewish people were hearing that they were going to be sent off into captivity, going into Babylon, they might have been asking themselves, well, wait a minute, what about the promises to Abraham? What about what God says through Melch David, King David, that there'd be one sitting on his throne? Is God forsaking his people? How were they to handle this coming invasion? How were they to handle going off into exile? How were they to handle, and how are they still to handle, dominion of the world by the hands of the Gentiles? Because I don't care what anyone says, World power is in the hands of the Gentiles today. It is not in the hands of Israel. Israel does not tell the world how it shall go. The world is busy trying to tell Israel how she should go. And it's not a good way. This whole chapter is going to tell them how to deal with that. How do you deal with something so depressing, so discouraging, so horrendous, what you're being told? Basically, they're being told you're going to be stripped of everything that is near and dear to you. They're not even guaranteed because in those days, a march like that, how many of the people would die on the way? How many loved ones would they lose in the march? Let alone what life would be like in this land of captivity. This was a very depressing message, a very discouraging message, and yet this chapter in the midst of that is called comfort. It's called hope. It's a guideline to get them through. And here again, I bring it to you today. Whatever your battle, whatever you're facing, consequences or actions that were not consequences, but you are a victim of, so to speak, and I use victim in quotes because with God you're not a victim, but this is to encourage you also to tell you how do you deal with your struggle, with your trial, with whatever you're facing. Well, let's look and see what we're told. We're going to jump down to verse 5 and come right back up to verse 3. We're not going to miss a word of this. Every word in this chapter is great. But look at again. Remember verse 5 telling us the glory of the Lord will be revealed. The flesh will see together. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Right there, it's the encouragement, the, the coming of the Lord. There's going to be a glory for this world yet. But... Before that day comes, and we know that we're even waiting and yearning for the uh, revelation of our Messiah for us in rapture, and then we know for the second coming for Israel and for the believing remnant at that time, there's much before that time period. So we're going to go back to verse 3, and we're going to see how we go through time. Excuse me, because it is necessary to be prepared. It's necessary for us to know God in a way that, that we can experience this comfort as we're waiting for that personal coming. Often in Bible times, there would be a messenger that would herald the way of a coming um, monarch. They would be preparing the way. This was a Near Eastern custom. It was sending a representative ahead 
to get things in order, to get things ready for this one who is, is like a king who is coming. Okay? The messenger, in this case, is not even going to be identified. My sorry, my, uh, there we go. Oh, okay. My, um, it came back. Good. Sorry, I lost my Bible for a moment. <laughs> um, okay, the, the messenger is not identified because the messenger isn't what's important. It's the message that's important. But we have some hints in here. We have some familiarity because, again, we have the advantage of looking back on some of this. We're right in the middle. We're in the middle of Isaiah promising the return from Babylon, and we see that happen, and we're waiting for that second coming. So we're right in the middle. When we look at verse 3, we're going to see who was being talked about for that early time. Okay, and let me tell you that the Hebrew construction of this verse, it puts the stress on the spiritual preparation that was greatly needed for the nations. Okay, because it's, well, let me, let me get there, okay? A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Okay, this voice is that messenger going out saying, we've got to clear the way, clear the way, clear the way. You know, you see that when the president's going to come out, there's people that clear the way for the president to come through. How about our movie stars where they roll out the red carpet for them to come through? A preparing of the way. You can see that in majesty today. So that's not hard to understand. But notice something. This one is clearing the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Now, if I've got you thinking Jewish... Wilderness. Hmm. Well, I remember a time our people lived in the wilderness for 40 years. So this is a very familiar circumstance. Is that a word I can use? Condition? They knew what the wilderness was like. They knew God provided. He provided mom every day. They were fed. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their needs were met. But it was 40 years the, of, of just going around in circles. They had obstacles. They had to overcome those obstacles, and then finally they're going to get into the promised land. Well, this reminds them of that, that this is a time when, in essence, they're wandering around in darkness. They're lost. Where do we go? How do we get there from here? Do you know what took 40 years could have taken 11 days? That's a big difference. You talk about a wandering Jew. <laughs> you talk about getting lost. Well, that's what we're seeing here, is that these people have uh, lost their way. They're in the darkness, yet in the midst of that darkness is a voice that is calling out and is crying out to them, and it's saying, we need to make the way ready. How are they going to make that way ready? They need to do something. Let's read it. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Okay, that's suggesting that they're, they're having to make a special road. There isn't a road there, they're making a special road. Yochanan, John, who we know was a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for Messiah. We know that, that he said he was to come before Messiah would come, that there would be, he wasn't the Messiah, there would be the one greater, who he wouldn't even be worthy of untying his shoe. But this one would be the one who would take away the sin of the world. Well, John prepared the people for that greater one who was coming? How? Did he prepare them by giving them gold coins? Did he prepare them by fixing a home for them? No, he prepared them by preaching the word of God, telling them, repent, quit trusting yourself, get rid of your self-righteousness. The way to know Messiah as king and a savior has nothing to do with self-righteousness. It is turning from our own ways. It's repenting. It is recognizing who God is. There is no religious externalism here. You can't lean on, well, I go to the right church. Oh, well, I was born in a Christian nation. Oh, well, I've got an advantage because, and fill in the blank any way you want. All that's stripped away. Remember, this is a new highway, a super highway. This highway, this way in the desert is prepared through the preaching of the word. It's prepared by the word of God. Um, trying to make sure I've gotten everything from my Hebrew in here too, and I think I have. Okay, so Yochanan, John came to help Israel remove that obstacle of self-righteousness. Remember in his day, there were those who thought they were 
they, they had it all together. They kept all the law. They did everything right. Remember the, the Pharisee and the publican that went to pray together. And the Pharisee, you know, puts on all his regalia, and he, he, uh, he's so proud of himself. And he's not like this poor, wretched beggar down here. And yet that one's the one who humbled himself, bowed his head, didn't even feel worthy to look up to God, and said, be merciful, forgive me, a sinner. That is what we are talking about, and that's the only way to get into this way to prepare is not in our own doing. It is realizing that it is churning to our God, who is the remover of all obstacles. This again is talking about his first coming, the first advent, sometimes it is called, and exactly what happened is what God said would happen. Yochanan cried, and he came. A way was prepared, a way for the Messiah to come. But again, we're going to see a greater fulfillment when in the tribulation time, again, they're finally going to be crying out for the one who they need to come, who will come, even as Malchi, Malchi chapter 4 says, that he would come um, in that great and terrible day. Let me, let me just read you a couple quick phrases. I'm going to just turn to it um, in my hard copy because I can get there faster. Um, Malchi, Malachi chapter 4, um, he tells, In the beginning, behold, the day comes that shall burn like an oven. All the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. The day comes to burn them up. Okay, tribulation time. His coming is judgment. But he says, Behold, I'll send you Eliyahu the prophet, Elijah the prophet. Remember, John would have fulfilled it had they accepted Messiah. So we know since they did not, we're looking now to that second coming. Before that second coming comes again, Eliyahu, Elijah. He's coming before the, or in that terrible, great and terrible day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. If the Lord didn't return, there would be no earth, no people left to come to. And when the hearts of the children are turned back to the fathers, it's turned back to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, to the God of our fathers, to his word, not just to dad one generation, but it's looking to all what our fathers stand for. So we see, really in the Hebrew here, a double meaning. We see it talking about the time for Yochanan the Mercer, John the Baptist, and we see it talking about the time when Eliyahu, Elijah, will come. So we see his first coming and the second coming of Messiah in this verse to clear the way for the Lord, make this smooth path in the wilderness, this, this new way. And now the following verses will show that man is temporal. Man is not uh, forever. Man, man's life is not immortal at this stage, and it's going to be man's okay ability in quotes because we're not able, but man's ability versus God's greatness. And again, the idea is going to be you've got to let go of self-sufficiency. You've got to turn from your own strategies. You've got to trust this loving God. Remember the tenderness, the comfort this loving God. And when you do, you're going to see the revelation of his glory. Verse 5. Remember, um, I think I've brought down the rest of three. I've, I think I've said enough. Um, making smooth, you know, removing the obstacles. Okay, and then as I come down, um, let every valley be lifted up. Oops. Okay. Tablet's doing funny things, or whatever this is. Uh, and every mountain and hill be made low, let the rough ground become a plain, the rugged terrain a broad valley. Even when all of this is changing, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. Okay, again, we know um, that the glory of the Lord is what's being referred to here. When we think of the glory of the Lord, we have to think of the very essence of our God. We're talking about his holy character now. We're talking about the power of our holy God. We're talking about this being the revelation of his glory. Now remember first coming, he came humbly. He came as a servant. He came to suffer and die. He's raised from the dead in that abundant life, but when he comes the second time, it's in all that glory. When we see the glory of God, we're seeing his power. We're seeing what can be the revealing of this character of our God, this power this love that we're talking about. And even though we have the first coming in view, we also have that second coming. The tribulation will prepare the way 
through catastrophic judgments. In the first time here, through the Babylonian captivity, in John's day, through the trials and tribulations because of, of Rome at that time, but especially fulfilled in the tribulation, Israel will finally be brought to her knees, and I don't mean broken at her knees, I mean where she will finally be on her knees in prayer, crying out to her God. What's going to bring her to that? The judgments. But in the midst of the judgments, there's 144,000 Jewish evangelists who are reaching her people worldwide. They have that special ministry. There's going to be a ministry of angels crying out the gospel message. There's going to be two witnesses, and I believe Elijah is, is obvious in view here, and Moshe is our other one. All of this will be happening during the tribulation times. This is the time of God's wrath. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. All of this is to accomplish the goal of bringing them back and where they will see the glory of the Lord. Now remember when we talk about the glory of the Lord, also the Shekinah glory of God, we are talking about Yeshua. Because if I took you quickly to Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, it starts in verse 1 that God spoke in various times in diverse manners through the prophets. It gives many examples through. But by the time you get to verse 3, it says that God's now speaking through his son. And who is his son? The express image, the glory of the Father. It's a beautiful study. I think I've taken you through it before. If not, we'll, we'll go back and revisit Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 in detail. But to finish Isaiah 40 in a class, I cannot uh, deviate any longer other than to say just realize when we're talking about the glory of the Lord, we are talking about the Shekhinah glory, we are talking about Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, in all his glory. And if you've been with me just recently in the study of the tabernacle and how the tabernacle of furniture was shadows of the real, and you also learn that we were made in his image, literally in his shadow, then you realize that as you come into that glory light, light on an object casts a shadow. And if we are shadowing our God, our light will look like him and will reflect his glory. That's a, another beautiful study to go into. But back on track. We have seen that the mouth of the Lord has spoken. All flesh will see it together. The only time the whole world is going to see it is when the Lord returns in second coming. It says that, that as the lightning goes from the east to the west, God's glory would be seen. The, the return of the Lord will be seen by the entire world. All flesh will see it. And I lost my place again. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. When God says it, it's done. Remember, we take that to the bank. We cash in on that. Verse 6 through 8 are going to, to now show us the difference. Remember, man's temporal. Man vanishes. Man's frail. Verses 6 through 8 are going to point that out. It's a, this is not going to happen because of man. This is not going to be ha happening because of man's ability. Verse 6, a voice calls. A voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? Okay, he's reaching out. What's he going to hear? All flesh is grass. All his loveliness is like a flower of the field. That grass that you appreciate, that grass withers. How many of you need to kick up your sprinklers like we do to get grass greener right now because the sun's coming stronger and we know how quickly grass can wither. The flower fades. If you take the Israeli sun, and they're living in Israel, they know Israeli sun, you can have a flower in the morning that's wilted by night because the sun hit upon it. That's what it's saying. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are like that grass. They can wither very quickly. The grass withers, the flower fades. You can't put your trust in anything else. What you look at, what you want to trust, can wither up and die in an instant. It's gone. In a day, it's gone. How many of you have known a life snubbed out in a day? It happens. There is nothing there to trust. What do we trust on that? If we're all just here today and gone tomorrow, if we're withering, we're fading, our glory is, is disappearing, what do we trust on? Look at what it says. The word of our God stands forever. 
Remember the beginning? We have to get into his word if we want to feel his comfort and if we want to know his comfort. This is the eternal character of our God. Remember, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. So when the word of our God stands forever, we are saying Messiah Yeshua Jesus stands forever. We are saying that his word in the scripture is a living word. This is not words on a page in a book that should be left sitting on a shelf. These are words that are alive today. Why has the Bible stood through time? Why was it an important book when it was written, important through the ages, and important today? No one's added to this word, to this Bible, for over 2,000 years. How could something be relevant today that was relevant 2,000 years ago? That's the living word of our God. Only the Bible meets that. Nothing else does. No other book that you can pick up that's been written apart from the Bible does this. Remember, the word of God is all-sufficient. It's inerrant. It's infallible. I want something I can trust on that securely. Something that, that has stood the test of time. This is God breathe. And man's attempt to stamp it out, Satan's attempt to rid the world of it, it's gone down in failure. They took the word of God out of school, did school improve? Is it doing good? Is it picking up? We've got Columbine and how many other shootings since? Put the word of God back into the school, people. Train the children on it. Let it be meat to them and see if there won't be a difference because this is a lie. This is infallible. This word cannot fail. It is God's holy word that gives comfort regardless of our stand, regardless of whether we're hurting or hungry or needy. It doesn't matter. The word of God stays true, stands true. It's gone through the annals of history. Nothing has been able to wipe out the Word of God. Let me take you to the Holocaust. And those who came through the Holocaust, who give a living testimony to the Holocaust, tell how the Word of God is what got them through. They were stripped of everything, but they had the Word of God. They had it, if they put it in their hearts, they had those who were there preaching it. There was one preacher that was arrested for probably for hiding Jews, I don't remember why, but he was a preacher who was in the concentration camp. Every morning, they would line those men up in his barracks. That about five minutes, they would stand out in the freezing weather, waiting for the, the commandant or whoever, you know, to come and, and take the roll and call out and had to be there. He realized he had five minutes of a captive audience, and he learned how to give the gospel message in five minutes. Every day at the top of his lungs, he preached the word of God to all of those men who were captive with him. Every day they heard the word of God. I want to know how many of those men are in heaven today because he preached the word of God. Even if your life is taken from you, your soul is spared. You can gain the whole world and lose your soul. And what is a profit of you? Nothing. But you can lose the whole world, gain your soul through salvation, and you have an eternity of heavenly glory. Hallelujah. The Word of God cannot be stopped no matter how Satan tries to come after it. God's Word is sure. You can believe on it. You can act on it. It does marvelous things. What does the Word of God do for us? We're going to see, because it's telling us the Word of God stands forever. We're going to see, and I'll give you a summary, and then we'll look at it. It brings us in fellowship with God through the message of salvation. You can't have a relationship with God till you're saved, folks. It extends our life into eternal life. That our future is eternal with our God. Eternal means forever. When does forever end? It doesn't end. And it assures us that God's promises will be fulfilled. I'm staking everything on it, people. Everything. In the realm of the eternity, there are eternal rewards. God's eternal word becomes a means of strength. It's a means of comfort. It brings shalom. It even brings joy in the midst of our ups and downs of life. 
while we're waiting to see, while we're experiencing what this world is, is throwing at us, we're waiting to experience those promises that God has made. But how many of you know, when you have a sure hope, when you know, when you, there's that light at the end of the tunnel, when you can hang on a little bit better because you know that day is coming. You know that answer is coming. You know that you know that you know. That's what the God, the Word of God will do. Let's look and see how I get that out of Isaiah 40. Let me scroll down. Come on. There we go. Okay. Whoops. I went a little... Come on. There we go. Okay, verse 9. This is going to proclaim the message. Okay, get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, Zion, a name for, for Israel, for Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Yerushalayim, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. That's the message. Here is your God. That Hebrew interjection is equal to our behold that we learned in Revelation. Remember behold? How many of you remember that? It's God saying, hello. Good, I see the hands. Hello. Wake up. Don't miss this. This is of critical importance. This is the crux of it. This is what matters. What is being said? Here is your God. God. Remember he said, my people in the beginning, and here he's saying, your God. This is your God. The focus of the attention is on that object because it's important. It's designed to get attention. It's designed to say, this is what's important. This is what matters. This is what we're hanging all of this on. This is the whole purpose, the whole argument of the writer. What is Isaiah saying to the people who are going to go into captivity, who need to know this? He is saying, even in the midst of captivity, even in the midst of knowing what all is going to happen, here is your God. That is great comfort. When you put your attention, your focus, on the God who is here. This is what happens. He now is a personal God. Behold your God. He's not just a God out there or the God of somebody else. He's your God. He is mighty deliverer and king. He's got an arm that's ruling. He is a rewarder and he is a shepherd. We're going to see all of these in these verses here. We're already seeing the personal. That's already there. We know again it's pointing to the future when the Lord comes to Zion, comes to Jerusalem, that he'll bring them out of Babylonian captivity. He'll bring them out of the tribulation. We know he'll set up his kingdom. But notice, if you are beholding, you are keeping your focus there. You are maintaining your focus on your God. You're not maintaining your focus on the circumstances. Your focus is on here is your God. And the rest of the chapter now, we're going to see comparisons and contrasts. We're going to see that the, when the focus and the attention is on the attributes and the activities of our God, when we are beholding our God, when our mind is dwelling on that, we have comfort. We have hope. We have what we need. When the focus is there, it brings into view what will fix our minds and our hearts on the truth of the Word of God. How many of you have heard me quote, say to you in a time of need, Yeshia, Isaiah, our very speaker here, but a little earlier, chapter 26 and verse 3, Thou will keep him in shalom, shalom, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. This is Isaiah 26, 3 being lived out. The mind is stayed on the Lord. The focus is fixed on the Lord. And when that happens, we have perfect peace. We have shalom, shalom. As we go through verses 9 through 26, we are going to see now that this is the God of all comfort. 
who is the comforter. He's the deliverer. He's the rewarder. We're going to see he's the shepherd. We're going to see all of this I've been saying. So let's read it. Um, I th I've read 9, 10. Behold, again, pay attention to this. Don't miss it. The Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. It, uh, the night Elohim comes with power is how the complete Jewish Bible puts it. This is the one who is is the deliverer. This is the one who we said is king. The one who is ruling, the ruler, the arm of the ruler is the king. So the one who is coming and coming in power and might is our deliverer. He is our king. That's power. How many times do you want a heavy hitter on your side? Why do we say that? Why do we say, I need a heavy hitter? We need power. Will that power plug into the light of the world? And you'll know, no power failure. He is our power. He is our king. And here we're being told he's the one who's going to deliver us. He comes with all his might. He comes with reward, his recompense before him. And then notice also, besides delivering, besides coming to, to reward, also says he comes like a shepherd. He will tend his flock. When we think of the shepherd, we don't think of that mighty king with an arm to rule, and we're even told in Psalm 2 he's going to rule with a rod of iron. We don't think of those terms when we think of the shepherd, do we? We see the other side, the attributes of God that are tender, that are loving, that are caring for the little sheep. We know that the shepherd is the good shepherd in Psalm 22 who lays down his life for the sheep. Psalm 22 will give us that. And we know from John 10 also that we're told that, that he is the shepherd, that we are the sheep in his pasture. Read those scriptures for yourself later. Psalm 23 points us to the great shepherd, the shepherd who is tending for and caring for the needs of his sheep. That goes through the life of a sheep in that chapter. Everything that they need, they're being tenderly cared for. That rock comes down so that they have to duck under it to go into the fold at night. That slows the sheep down, so they have to go in one by one, and they go slower than if they could just all cram in at once. That lets the shepherd look at each little sheep as he goes through. Oh, okay, I noticed this one has a, a scratch, needs some salve on his head. Uh-oh, this one has some burrs in his fur. He's going to need those taken out before they get down to the skin. The shepherd makes a mental note of everything he sees that his sheep needs as they go into the fold that night. And then he tends lovingly and caring for them. So the next day, they're better and ready for going back out. That's what we see in the great shepherd in Psalm 23. And that shepherd even walks through the valley of the shadow of death. We know that personally. Psalm 24 will point us to the chief shepherd. And it's very interesting that when 1 Peter 5, 4 refers to the chief shepherd, it's the one who comes in glory giving the reward. What did we just read here? That he's the God of glory coming as the one ruling, and his reward is with him to recompense, to give out to those before him. So as we see the chief shepherd, we're reminded the chief shepherd is the glory of the Lord ruling and reigning. How beautiful to see this analogy and even just this. We see it out in other scriptures but summarized here in 10 and 11. This shepherd in verse 11 is like the shepherd that in his arm he will gather the lambs. He picks them up. He carries them in his bosom. You know where his bosom is? Right here. Right on his heart. I picture that little lamb feeling the warmth of the shepherd's body and as the little lamb quiets down in the arms of his shepherd, instead of hearing the bah, he hears the shepherd's heartbeat. And that heartbeat speaks peace, comfort to that little lamb. Whatever so disturbed it, hurt it, that it needed to be picked up, held, and loved, that's what we're seeing pictured here. And he gently leads the nursing youths, the mamas, that need to be tended to gently and carefully. They can't be going on long treks to get food and water and being taken to a new area. He takes care of them right where they are, gently. That's love. So huge, he's a giant, but so tender that we see it 
and a little shepherd. Amazing picture, isn't it? Now we're going to look at some rhetorical questions, and these questions are going to make the reader focus on God versus our nature. And when we see God versus us, then we need to look at our problems in that comparison. When we compare our problems to our God, remember, if we've got a big God, we've got a little problem. But if we don't look at our God in His glory, and we just keep Him small because we don't feed on His Word, and we don't come to know Him, and we don't plug into obedience and life that He can bless, then we have big problems. But this is our God. And we want to see our problems through the backdrop of his incomparable majesty. And that's what's going to bring us comfort. When I know that I'm scared and I'm shaking and I'm nervous and someone big and powerful puts his arms around me and is protecting me from the big bad wolf, I feel safe in those arms. I feel love. I hear that heartbeat and I know I'm being carried. And I don't have to worry whatever that big giant was. I know that giant can come down with a little rock. David rocked Goliath to sleep. Okay, let's look at that. Let's see. Why am I saying this great God? Is that just me saying it? Or did Yeshua say it? Did Isaiah bring it to us? Well, let's look at verse 12 and see what we're going to find out. And I give you a hint that verse 12 is going to speak to God's power that is limitless. It's God who is omnipotent, which means he transcends everywhere. Even the vastness of the universe, God is greater than and beyond and above. Even the universe can't contain our God. If you picture the universe and your problem, I think your problem is shrinking, is it not? Okay? Let's look at that. Verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Can you pick up the water of the ocean and measure it and tell how much is there? How many handfuls are in an ocean? And marked off the heavens by the span. Can you measure heaven? Do you know every time science tries, they find out they can't? And they admit there's black holes and we don't know how deep there are and we don't know what's beyond those black holes and they find out that we're a galaxy in the midst of galaxies in the midst of and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on this is who our God is he's the one who marked off the heavens he's the one that has calculated the dust of the earth by the measure how much dust is in my house, let alone how much dust is under my feet, and how much dust is in this world. And oh, by the way, the clouds are formed off the dust of his feet. He's measured this. He knows the dust of the earth. He knows the size of the heavens. He knows how much water is in the ocean. And the hills in a pair, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a line, and weigh the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales. With it is saying, how can you measure a mountain? How can you weigh it? How can you know size? He's bigger than the mountain. He's deeper than the earth. He's higher than the heavens. He's greater than whatever you can think of. That is a mighty God. That is the God, remember verse 10, verse 9, sorry, here is your God. What's Isaiah giving to them? All the comfort, all the hope, and all the help you can ever want, no matter when, no matter where, no matter what. Verse 13, we're going to look at the wisdom of this God. He is not only omnipotent, all-powerful, but he is also all-knowing, omniscient. He is all-wise, all I can't think of the word for it, but his wisdom Omniscient. Omniscient speaks to his wisdom. His wisdom is unsearchable. Look at verse 13. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? Basically, this is saying the eternal God, who does he consult with? Who does he turn to when, he's, when there's a problem? Ha! God doesn't have a problem. He doesn't turn to anyone. 
God is all wisdom, all knowing, all power, all sufficiency, and he needs no counsel. He is so wise. Remember Job, Job, he couldn't understand his calamities, but he drew the conclusion God even had the right to give and the right to take away. He moved from the fine line between desiring from God and demanding from God to the relief that comes in the face of our trial when we yield ourselves into the hands of this omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty God. That's what we're reading here. Who's directed the Spirit of the Lord? Only the Lord Himself. Who's His counselor? He needs no counselor. Verse 14, with whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? Who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge? Obviously, the answers to this are no one. No one can do this. God is all-knowing. He is the one that is all truth. And then we read also and inform him of the way. Of, did I skip a line? I think I did. Sorry. When my, tablet, my thing moves, I have to find myself again. Uh, who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding. And justice is, is the rightness, the fairness. We see the unfairness of this world, but God in his hands, it is all just, it is all fair. That's what Job, Job came to realize. No matter what, God is fair, God is just, God is in control. No one's needing to inform him, no one's needing to help him understand, nobody's needing to cancel him, and no one can inform him how to understand. That is an amazing God. And let's look at him, okay? Let's keep this in view. Verse 15, again, the word, Behold, don't miss this. This is your God. The nations, all the nations are like a drop from a bucket, okay? He's authority. He is absolute. You can't say, but the nation's too big, God. The nation's going to swallow us up. You want proof? Little Israel, could 14 of Israel, could fit in California. 14 times over, you could put the state of Israel in California. Does that tell you how tiny she is? She's smaller than New Jersey, okay? She's surrounded by 22 Arab countries. <laughs> They're her enemy. They want to push her into the sea. Now, if you've got something that little against nations that are huge, look at Saudi Arabia alone, who, by the way, right now is befriending Israel, and Israel's befriending her, but that's beside the point. But, but look at the Arab nations. They are so much larger than she is. Someone once said that Israel had the unfortunate experience of being born in a bad neighborhood. We laugh at that, but it's true. Why is there still an Israel today? Because Israel's powerful? Because Israel does it all right? Because Israel worked it up and Israel figured it out and Israel's got the answers? <laughs> no. Because behold her God. Behold her God. This is who we're talking about. This God, this authority. The nations are like a drop in the bucket, are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Oh, there goes the United States. There goes Russia. They're nothing in comparison to the magnitude of our God. Remember, he's bigger than the heavens. So how can a little nation be a threat? And Israel needs to remember that and cry out to her God in her time of need. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor is peace enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. When we go through these verses, we're seeing that, that there's nothing that these nations can offer. Lebanon is known for the cedars of Lebanon, those huge, beautiful trees, and yet there's not enough to even burn. It, you could burn it all down. It's not nothing in comparison to our God. Not even enough beasts for the burnt offering. So you could bring all the wealth of the world, all the benefit from an area. It's nothing compared to our God. That's what it's trying to tell us here. The sovereignty of our God. He is establishing his throne in the heavens. His sovereignty is ruling over all the earth. Let me take you to Psalm 103, verse 19. Psalm 103, verse 19. Whoops, we went to Isaiah. Let's go to Psalm 103. 
And verse 19, I have to scroll down real quick. Sorry, I'll get there in just a moment. There we go. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Does that not say it? Does that not sum it all up? Now go to chapter 115. <laughs> to Halim 115. When you're there, look at verse 3. Psalm so 115 and verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. That's who I want to be on his side, and I want him on my side. <clears throat> this God that is so great. Let's compare now. Let's see what we can liken him to. Okay, verse 18, and I'm going to have to scroll down here, so give me just a moment. My mouse is off the... <coughs> okay, sorry. This is why I don't like working with this during class, but... Okay, and I went too far again. There we go. Okay, to whom then will you liken God? <coughs> Excuse me. His being is incomparable. Our God is infinite. He is without limits. We've already said that. The vastness of the heavens speaks to his majesty. Let me remind you. We started studying in Bereshit in Genesis, and we've studied at other times the magnanimity of this creation of our God. Let me just give you a couple of statistics to remind you. If Earth was represented by a one-inch ball, shrink Earth down to one inch, the nearest star would be 51 thousand miles away. If Earth was an inch, the nearest star, 51,000 miles away. <clears throat> the moon, the planets, and a few thousand stars are visible to the naked eye, and that is equal to a single drop of water in the boundless sea of the universe. What we see is not even a drop in the bucket. <clears throat> Example, take our sun hollow our sun out. It could contain more than one million worlds the size of Earth. Our sun could. But do you know there are stars out there in space that are so large they could easily hold 500 million suns the size of ours? <laughs> Can you comprehend? Did I just open the flap and make the top blow up? <laughs> Wow, there are a billion stars in the average galaxy and at least 100 million galaxies in the known universe. And what's in the unknown universe? Again, when you see your problems against this backdrop, how can you compare your problem to an incomparable God, the God of creation? Okay, uh, let's see, what verse did we leave off? I guess we're at verse 21. Oh, I think I skipped 20. Um, I summarize the meaning of 20. When he is too impoverished for such an offering, no matter if we brought all our wealth to, the, to God, it's not enough for an offering. It selects a tree that doesn't rot, okay? We'll, we'll try to give God from the wood. We'll create from the wood, wood like a, he seeks out for himself a skilled craftsman. This craftsman, all he can do from that wood is prepare an, all, an idol. That idol can't do anything. That idol, is, it, it, it just it says it will not totter. What it means is if you brought down the trees, you can't bring down God, okay? Do you not know? <clears throat> Do you not know? Have you not heard? I can just hear Yeshaya Isaiah by this point saying, Hello? Do you not get this? Don't you know? Haven't you heard? Has it not been declared from the very beginning from our Jewish ancestors? Have you not understood that from the foundations of the earth, it's he. Remember, behold, here is your God. It is he. It is this God who sits above the circle of the earth. He inhabits, or the inhabitants of the earth are like grasshoppers. Have you ever gotten to go up in a plane? and you see these little ants moving around on the earth, that's our God looking down on us. We're like a grasshopper who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Can you picture a tent with a curtain and he just draws it open and here's his bedroom, all of heaven? That's his bedroom. That's just 
the beginning of the infiniteness of our God. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing. Remember, you wanted that great mighty king? Well, how about the eternal king, the one who rules with the rod of iron, the one who is king of kings? That's what he's saying, that he reduces all the rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Who cares what this judge is saying? The God the judges that matters is the one who sits in the heavens, who sits above the circle of the entire earth. He's the one whose judgment matters. Scarcely have they planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth. They try to do all these things. They try to plant. They want to leave a legacy. They try to sow their will, their ways. They try to leave it behind for others to follow. Scarcely has it even begun to take root. And what happens if God so desires? If he merely blows on them, <laughs> they go away like my computer. If he merely blows on them, they wither. And the storm carries them away like stubble. Stubble is gone and forgotten. That's our God. You want to compare to the kings of this earth, to the judges of this earth, to the rulers of this earth, and you want to worry about what they think or what they're doing, this is not the one who you need to be concerned about. This is not the one who matters. This one that we have can just in a, and they're gone. Okay? Verse 25. To whom then will you liken me? That I would be his equal. Okay, God said, I'm above it all. I'm greater than it all. Who are you going to compare me to? Lift up your eyes on high. When you look up on high, what do you see? You see who has created these stars. Remember, he created those stars, those billions of stars that I just mentioned, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name. Do you know that's telling us that he's named all the stars? How would you like to keep track of the billions and billions of stars by name? Oh my goodness, what a mind is our God. As a teacher, if you are a substitute teacher, you have to learn 30 names of 30 children in a heartbeat and try to hold on to those 30 for a day. Try billions, 7 billion people on this earth. Try all the stars in the heavens. This is our God. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Not one star is missing, let alone when it comes down to his people that he calls my people. That is amazing. We know it to be true even in the stars that they can regulate, that they know when a comet is coming and when a comet has gone because of the orderliness. I see the orderliness of God. He's called them by name. He knows them all. They serve his purpose, and not one of them. The light goes out, but what God has known. They don't go missing. This is a mighty God. I think we can say he is incomparable, that he is infinite, and he is without limits. I think verses 18 to 26 told us that. So now we're going to turn and look in a different way, starting with verse 27, because Isaiah is going to touch on one of their problems now. And that problem, there is a consequence for it. And it is a wrong focus. This is where we need to wake up and pay attention because this is how we can apply it to ourselves also again. This wrong focus was keeping Israel from experiencing the comfort of the Lord. They had a blurred focus. They had a distorted perspective. And because of that, Yeshua is going to ask two questions. The intent behind these questions is to bring reproof, to bring correction. He's going to ask why, and we're going to see that that's the first word, why. Now that question is meant to be reproof. It's designed to expose the problem. It's designed to make them evaluate, examine their ways, examine their thoughts, examine their attitudes, examine their actions. They need to be asking themselves certain questions. And again, we can apply this to ourselves. Those questions are going to be concerning knowing God and hearing the Word of God. Because it's designed to expose that the greater emphasis is on bringing that correction about by pointing out the problem to them. Their failure to know their God relates to the problem they're having in their life now. 
It's relating to their lives. If they knew God's greatness through his word, through trusting in him, they wouldn't have this problem. But they don't have that. They don't know this God. They don't know, have his view. They don't, they're not focused on him. He takes and makes everything work for our good. You can see a vine growing on and around a great oak tree. On one side, the wind is buffeting it. And because that wind, it puts its tentacles stronger into the trunk and it clings to that trunk for its strength. On the other side, it's not pressing into that oak because it's not in need of that. Sometimes God protects us from the storm and we're fine, like the vine on the back side of that oak. But sometimes God allows us into that storm so that we cling to him. Remember, he's the vine, we're the branches. Our fruit comes through him. If we're not attached to that vine, there's no life. But the idea is your troubles, your issues, your problems should cause you to press in more tightly. Cling like that vine does in the midst of the storm. And in these verses, we're going to see that Isaiah describes the people as Jacob and Israel. And when he uses those two names, Yaakov and Israel, he is reminding them that they are people of the covenant of promise. God made a promise with Yaakov. God made promises to Israel. And it's that covenant-keeping God who is redeemed. It's that covenant-keeping God who has revealed himself. It's that covenant-keeping God who has made an conditional promises. And since he is God a creator of creation, the God of, uh, the creator God, the preserver of all things, even the heavenly bodies, even the nations, individually, men, how can you say, especially if you are God's people, how can you doubt? How can you say when you've got such unconditional promises, such privileges, such comfort and such hope, how can you say that God has forsaken you? But yet, look at what we're going to read. Let's start going through this and we're going to see it because right off the start, there's that why. Remember, wake up and realize and understand. This is to reprove you. Why do you say, O oh, Jacob, you who have the relationship with the covenant-keeping God, why do you assert, or another word is complain, why do you complain, O oh, Israel? And this word for complaint or for assert in here gives the idea of repeatedly. It's a persistent action. They are complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining. And this was the pattern of Judah. This was the pattern of Israel. We know that. But the precise circumstances are not given here so that you can't look at it and say, oh, well, it was just complaining about this. The idea is you should complain about anything. We should not be uttering complaints, even in times of difficulty and adversity. That's not what should be coming out of our mouth. That's not where our focus should be. That's not where our attention should be. Remember, the question is raised to rebuke them, to expose them, to get them to evaluate their own thoughts and their own actions in light of who their God is. Remember, we're still saying, here is your God. And it's going to show them, or us, if we're applying it, how far they've drifted from the anchor that is their hope in the Lord. Those trials and pressures, no matter how severe, are never an indication that God has forgotten them, or is unconcerned about them, doesn't see them, doesn't have attention. No. That's what they're saying. They're complaining. Now, it's not specific, but they're saying in their complaint, my way is hidden from the Lord. What does that teach us about their hearts? These people were living in unbelief. They were living in ignorance, maybe, of the ability of their God, how great their God is. It's, it's one or the other. I mean, it's the details of, of their life that they don't know God, or they're, you know, that they're ignorant of God. Somehow, Isaiah is saying, how can you miss the love and the concern that your God has for you? How can you say that he's not concerned about your affairs and your needs? How can you say, and this is what they're saying in these words, 
he's not interested in me. Or he's too busy to be concerned about these things. The, the affairs of my life and my needs. That's all lies. That comes from the father of lies and he needs to go back to the pit of hell. Excuse me, but that's where it is. That's what he'll feed you is doubt. He'll tell you God doesn't know or God doesn't care if he does know. Well, this is to, to provoke those thoughts to, to the foolishness that they are. That how can you, Israel, how can you, Jacob, who has this God who is so omnipotent, so powerful, who has given you such precious promises, how can you say that? Deuteronomy, Dabarim, 11 and verse 12. It is a land of an eye your God cares for. He's saying, Israel, I care for your land. Now, how much does he care for that land? Is it a, oh, I'll, I'll get around to you tomorrow, or I'm busy with another nation, I'll come back to you when I can? It says, the eyes of Adonai, your God, are always on it. From the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Is there a day that God's eye is not on Israel? No. To be honest, if there was a day God's eye wasn't on Israel, there would be no Israel. That would be the day of her demise. But that will never happen. Is there a day when God's eye is not on you? No. He knows the number of hairs on your head, and that's not the same today as it was yesterday, and it's not even the same this morning as it will be tonight. That's a God whose eye is always on you. Amos, remember one of Isaiah's contemporaries, Amos chapter 9 and verse 8. Look, the eyes of Adonai Elohim are on the sinful kingdom. This disqualifies them from saying, well, God's eyes aren't on us because we're rebellious people. No, he's well aware that you're rebellious. He's calling you back. He's not letting you go. He's going to child train you. He's going to bring you back. He says, I will wipe it off the face of the earth, yet I will not completely destroy the house of Jacob, the house of Yaakov, says Adonai. Yes, there's calamity coming. Yes, there's going to be much horror, but not because God's forgotten or forsaken. It's because rebelliousness reaps what it sows. And if you sow the wrong crop, then you can't complain when you harvest what you sowed. But God's going to be there. He's not going to let it be your end. He's not going to let it be the end of Israel. I believe that this, this saying this, you know, my way is hidden from the Lord. The justice to me escapes the, the notice of my God. This world isn't fair. My God isn't noticing. They're not dealing with me justly. They're not dealing with me fairly. Well, hello. They haven't with Israel all along, and yet she's still standing because of her God. And that's what he's bringing out. I think it's revealing the hardness of their soul. They're so full of self-pity. They're full of bitterness. You know, your problems can either make you better or bitter. You turn toward God, you become better. You turn at God or away from God, and you will become bitter. It's showing a frustration. It's showing a rebellion. Sometimes even demanding an anger. God, you have to do this. That's not the way to talk to your God. It's not to develop from God a relationship where I can get my own way. That isn't what God is saying. It's their failure, Israel's failure, to do what they are told to do up in verses 9 and 10. Behold your God. Don't look at that problem. Don't look at that injustice. Don't draw your own conclusions. You need to look at your God. He has never neglected you. Quit the mindset that nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I guess I'll go eat worms. <laughs> Do you hear Eeyore? You know, no matter what happened in Eeyore's life, it was gloomy. <laughs> well, I think that, that it's followed by that next complaint, which says, my right is disregarded by my God. Um, where is it? The justice to me escapes the notice of, of uh, my, my God in the Hebrew, in a complete Jewish Bible, I'm sorry. When it says, my way is hidden from God, my rights are ignored by my God. That's what it's saying. The Hebrew meaning behind that phrase is the idea that someone passes over or by. That they come very close. It's a picture of somebody who's in great need. 
I'm going to remind us of uh, the Good Samaritan story, the one who was beaten up and laid on the side of the road. Someone comes very close, walks right by, obviously sees, but isn't doing anything about that person's need. That's what they were saying, that, that God's just forgetting them in that same way. Life's not fair. God's just ignoring me. I've escaped his notice. He doesn't care. He's just passing me by. It's being stranded on the freeway. Your car's on the side of the road, and a car's are just passing by. That's the picture that's here. But notice in this answer, okay? Um, and let me find where it is. It's going to be in verse 28. I think it's verse 28 that it's going to be. I am looking for, okay. Uh, no, I guess, well, 27 even says it too. Uh, let me go to 28, sorry, sorry. Um, I gotta find it. Okay, what I'm getting at is that addressed, the way God's addressed is as the Lord my God. That's what I'm looking for right now. I'm trying to find it real fast. I know it's here. Um, okay, it's going to pop up here. Ah, why do you say, O oh, Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God. There we go, okay? The first he says, the way is hidden from the Lord. And then he says, it escapes the notice of my God. Okay, when it uses that word Lord, when he says, my way is hidden from the Lord, the word in the Hebrew is Yahweh. That's the yud heh vav heh And when that word is used, that's the special name where God reveals himself to Israel, shows a special love, a special revelation, a special redemption for the nation of Israel. So they're taking his very name and missing the whole point of it, that this is Jehovah. This is the one. This God that they're to behold is the one who has a special relationship with them, a special care. He's not ignorant of their ways, and they are ignorant of his divine essence. When it comes down to that, he is my God. Remember again, my God. It's personalizing. They had that wrong focus. They were, because of the hardening of their hearts over time, because of, of, of going their rebellious way, instead of turning back to their God, they were becoming more and more frustrated, and as the heart or the eyesight becomes more and more unfocused, they're getting foggy perceptions of God. It's like seeing God through a haze, and so they're missing that this God is so great, this God is in relation to them personally. My God, Jehovah, my God, the one who has special relationship with me. Instead, they're coming out with self-pity and they're coming out with a spirit of demanding. God, it's your fault. You're not doing anything when you should. Oh, hello. I would not want to say that to God. <laughs> they need to see their view is, is torqued, tor tor is bad. They need a corrective lenses put on. How do you get corrective eyesight? Get into the Word. Get into hearing and being obedient to the Word. Then they will see the rainbow that comes out of the storm. They will see Yov clinging tenaciously to his God, saying in chapter 1, verses 21-22, Naked I came from my mother's room, and naked I will return there. Adonai gave, Adonai took. Blessed be the name of Adonai. And then the, the scripture that tells us how right that attitude is says, In all of this, you know, neither committed a sin nor put the blame on God. I would not have the audacity to put the blame on God. If there's blame to be had, I need to look at my focus. I need to look at my eyesight and I need to put on corrective lenses and see my God, who is a rainbow in the midst of the storm who brings me through that storm and brings me out into the brilliance of his glory. Now, getting that correction and eye correction, we've got our second set of questions starting in verse 28. And this is going to suggest that their knowledge is not only inadequate, it's not only shallow, but they have failed to truly listen to the word of God. We have to have ears to hear we have to have a conscience that allows those words to be applied to our hearts. The word of God is no comfort if the spirit of, of ourselves or of Israel is questioning God's love and his justice. 
if you question, how can you do that, God? How can you say you love me and do that? How can you do this injustice? Then you're not in a place where you're going to be able to see and hear the comfort of God's word. You need to be corrected. You need to realize your way is not hidden from your Lord. His justice is not escaping. It's not injustice that's done to you. Verse 28 is going to nail it now and start bringing this point home. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Who's lacking? You're lacking. You don't know. You haven't heard. What have you not known? What have you not heard? The eternal or the everlasting God, the Lord, Jehovah, the creator, remember how great, of the ends of the earth. He does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. Let me back you up, and we're going to take 28 to 31 in, com in complete totality here. But what we're saying is rather than questioning God and saying, God, you're lacking, we need to learn to wait on our God. We want it. We want it now. We demand, and we should find ourselves pulled up short. The one time Job raised his fist at his God, God nailed him, put him flat on his face where he couldn't do anything but look up and realize, my God, the God of this creation, the God who is so magnanimous, how dare I, a mere speck of dust, raise my fist at my God, question his judgment, say that he's uncaring, this God who has unconditionally made covenant with me, with my people, Israel, how can you go there? How can you even say that? This God that is your God, he doesn't become weary. He doesn't become tired. He never runs out of strength. He never runs out of energy. He never says, wait till the next day. I need some time off. He is always able to meet whatever need. And the problem is, is his understanding is inscrutable. That means his understanding can't be fathomed. We're trying to understand God on our level. Fit him into our mold. Make it make sense in our little pee on brains. My brain was blown when I realized how magnanimous this heaven was. And he sits above the heaven on the circle of the earth. And he created that heaven. And he put all those stars out there and named each one of them. And he keeps them in order. He doesn't lose one of them, let alone one of his people. That is where that focus needs to be. Not that, God, you're unfair. God, you're unjust. This isn't right. Do you think he can do better than God? Wait on him. See what he's doing. And who are you waiting on? Are you just waiting on a nobody? Or are you waiting on a God who is so amazing that this comforter, is going to strengthen us in our waiting. That waiting isn't just marking time. That waiting isn't serving no purpose. In that waiting comes our strength. What were they crying out for? They needed strength. How are they going to get through captivity, out of their land, suffering the consequences of their actions? By waiting on their God, who in that time of captivity in that consequence will be strengthening them. How can I say that? Do you not know? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth who does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. What we are seeing is he is sovereign. He is in charge. He is in charge to the ends of the earth. That's what verse 28 is telling us. Then verse 29 tells us you don't just rest in God's sovereignty, verse 28, you rest in God's omnipotence, verse 29. The problem isn't a result of God's weakness. He does not become weary or tired. In fact, that's still verse 28. We're still in verse 28. God's omnipotent. He's sovereign above the earth, all creation. He is omnipotent. The problem is not that he is weak. We rest in the fact of God's omniscience, seen in the same verse. God knows what he's doing. The understanding, unsearchable. 
the understanding inscrutable, the understanding unfathomable to puny little human brain. So get rid of that self-righteousness, get rid of that self-pride, get rid of that I know better, get rid of any of that that makes you lean on your own understanding. You lean on God, you trust in His understanding. He knows what you don't know. And the same way you've protected a little child who wants to run out into something that would hurt that child and you hold that child back, that's what your God will do. That's what your God is doing. He's not weary. He's not tired. He's not forgotten. He's not uncaring and he's not unknowing. This is a great God. All sovereign. All powerful. All knowing. We rest in that God. That's just verse 28. We're resting in this God, verse 29, who gives strength to the weary. That's God's love. That's God's care. Are we weary in our trials and tribulations? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Human frailty wearies quickly. We know that weariness. God knows that weariness. And instead of God saying, oh, I'll just take it away so that you stay a limp little vine, he says, let me use this storm to cause you to cling, to cause you to hold on to me tight so that when the wind is passed by, you're stronger, you're better, you're not left in the same place. Even though they're going to go off in a captivity, they're going to come out better. This is the one who gives strength to the weary, and in our Hebrew, it's continually giving strength to the weary. It's not just once, it is continual. He is continually giving you strength. If you feel weary, remind yourself of that, that he is giving you strength. No matter whether you understand or not, to him who lacks might, he increases power. We've got to learn to wait on the Lord. You know, this is the microwave generation. We want to enjoy a whole evening, and we want it in three minutes out of our microwave. We don't want a three-hour dinner cooked in the oven. We want to pop it in that microwave, pull it out in three minutes, sit down, and enjoy it. God is teaching us to wait on Him. Verse 30. Uh, actually, 31 is the one that says, those who wait for the Lord, okay? But we're going to go back to verse 30. Let me just give you in 31 that those who wait, in the same way that He's giving strength continually, that waiting is a participle that shows continual action also. It's one who is characterized in waiting. You don't just wait, okay, it's done. No, you've got to continually wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord. The Hebrew word is kava, and that means to gather together, to look, to patiently tarry, wait for, or wait on, or wait upon. There's nothing fast about that. That's a timely process. And originally it meant to twist or bind together as was used in a twisting process that they would make a rope with, and this was known to the people at the time. This rope was an instrument or a tool that would become so strong it was capable of holding a heavy weight. Have you ever needed to pick up something heavy and you've got to use something to support it. If you go get a little thin string, it's going to break and drop. If you get some, some yarn, it might be stronger than that string, and it might begin to pick it up or hold it for a minute, but if you need to pick up something really heavy, you want twine. You want something that's interwoven, that's more than one put together. A three-fold cord is strong enough to be to not be broken. Remember saying one isn't good, two is better, but a threefold cord is even stronger. And I see in that threefold our triune God. He is the one who is able to strengthen us and enable us to wait on him. Because remember, he's pouring the strength into us. We're not working it up on our own. He's continually giving. All we have to do is continually wait. Those who wait in true faith will have their, their strength renewed so that they're able to serve the Lord. They're able to see his saving work. Even if it's coming in a time in the future, they'll be able to look and say, I know that I know that I know. Daniel gives us that example. He knew 
when he read captivity was to be 70 years, they were coming up on the end of that 70 years, that's when he went to his God and said, now is the time. This is when you've promised it. Raise up the leaders that will bring us back. He didn't ask for it day one. He didn't ask for it 40 years in the captivity. He asked for it in the future. He looked. He had that faith. He waited on his God. He was strengthened through his time. And at the end of that captivity, promised by God, the faithfulness of God came and they were delivered. Faith isn't believing that God can. It's knowing that he will. That's a step further. And those that wait will realize this about their God. They will realize his promises will be fulfilled. In the meantime, the believer who waits survives by counting on God's goodness, by counting on his love, by counting on his wisdom. All that we've been talking about, this is how you encourage yourself. Remember, you've got to be in the word, hearing the word, applying the word acting in accordance with that word, focusing your eyes through the lens of the word of God. Not through your own sight, but through the lens of the word of God. Make your rope strong. Make it intertwined. The word of God, hear it preached. Hear it taught. Get into it for yourself. Be in his word. Be in prayer. All of these form a strong cord, a relationship between you and God that's not easily broken. That will develop courage. That will develop strength. That will develop endurance that when it's formed is an instrument God can use for his glory. Isn't that what we were created for? Isn't that what we were redeemed for? To be a reflection of God's glory? Remember if you were with me in the study of the shadow made in his image, the closer we are to that light, the bigger the shadow, the brighter it is the better the more like the the real that it is that's what we are to be doing and that's when we will realize and we will be able to say behold your God your God reigns this is who we're holding on to this is the one and this is brought home very practically in these last verses those you thought I was gonna leave it out I'm not though though you grow weary and tired. Remember, he's just said, to those who lack strength, he gives his power. Though youths grow weary and tired, he's going to replace the weakness with his strength. And that's what he says. They will renew their strength in verse 31. But in verse 30, though the youths grow weary and tired, vigorous young men stumble badly. What happens? Does God leave them there? Does he say, well, you blew it. No, he says, I see your weakness. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And he says that those who wait for the Lord, what's he going to do? He's going to lift them out of despair. He's going to allow them to soar. They will gain new strength. This is the strength he's pouring into them. They will gain new strength. And that new strength is going to cause them to mount up with wings like eagles. Do you know the eagles get like new wings? They, they lose the plumes and the feathers and new ones form underneath and then the old is cast off. They will form new wings. They will have new strength. They will rise up. They will be able to soar. This isn't just flying. This is soaring. Where does the eagle fly? He flies high. He flies alone because he's got to be there. It's just him and his God. Not depending on others, not relying on others. It is in God's strength that you will soar above your circumstances. You're not going to wade through them. You're going to soar above them. He's going to renew your strength. He's going to give you new strength. The endurance is going to lift you up so you can soar like the eagles. Or you'll have the endurance of the runner. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Daniel 11.32b says, But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Or another uh, complete Jewish Bible says they will stand firm and prevail. When you wait on God, He gives you the strength. 
lifts you up. You soar like the eagle. You run like the runner that can run a long distance and doesn't grow weary. You've been brought down to two choices. You can either choose despair and lean on your own understanding and wallow in your lack, or you can turn away from man's devices and turn to the comfort of your God. How do you turn to the comfort of your God? Behold your God. Here is your God. Israel, this is the one you can trust on. He is the one who has made covenant with you. He is the one that's made unconditional promises, who loves you. You can act on those promises. And when you have your focus fixed on Him, because you're trusting in Him, that's when you have eagle eyes. You're going to soar like the eagle. And you're going to run like the one who doesn't grow weary. That's His promise to the nation of Israel, and to all who call him my God, and he calls you your people. Does this give you new insight to the comfort of your God? Is this not love that is unconditional love? You, you know that you know that you know that nothing can separate you from the love of your God. I want to take you in closing, and those of you who were with us yesterday got a great devotional on this, but it is the climax. Romans 8, 28 to 39. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, those who He knew in advance, He predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Remember this whole thing, we're becoming like his image. We're reflecting his glory, we're his shadow, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. Who's doing it? He's doing it. This one who is all power that we've talked about. What then shall we say to these things? What shall we say to our problems? What shall we say to the, the world that wants to come against us, wants to devour us? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare even his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Will he not give you strength? Will he not give you wisdom? Will he not give you wings? Will he not lift you up? Will he not give you endurance? All things. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? If you're his chosen people and you've got all that, who can bring anything against you? Certainly, God's not the one who the one who justifies you. Who's the one who's going to condemn you? Certainly not Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, who died for you. Yes, rather even more than just dying for you, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding. That means he's bleeding for us. Who will separate us from the love of Messiah? Will tribulation? Ha! We just talked about tribulation. They're going into captivity. It doesn't get worse than that. Could that separate them from the love of their God? Will distress? Will persecution? Will famine? Will nakedness? Will peril? Will sore? It's written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. There are these problems in this world. There are perils. There are tribulations. There are trials. There are times you go hungry or there's a need. But God doesn't leave you there. In all these things, verse 37, we are overwhelmingly conquerors, super conquerors in the complete church Bible, through him who loved us. For I am convinced, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, that's other heavenly rulers, nor things present, things to come, nor powers, height, depth, that's the powers above, that's powers below, nor any other created thing. 
will be able to separate us from the love of, and I'm going to insert one word, my God. You, I should say our God because I'm speaking to all of us, but personalize it. Nothing can separate you from the love of your God, which is in Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. Wow. Got a problem? Need comfort? Need strength? Need endurance? Need wisdom? What do you lack that your God doesn't have to give you? Behold your God. Lastly, and in closing, I'm going to put it in the vernacular of the Bible called the message. I don't advocate this one for a good study. It's a little too loose, but it's got a redeeming quality when it comes to this because it just kind of says it where we live. And I'll read it through you quickly for you. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending us his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who has raised a life for us, is in the very presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way, no trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. They say they kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. But none of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. I love the way that puts it, brings it home. I think whatever can you can create in your mind is covered in one of those versions. And when you realize what a great God we have, this creator of the universe, all sovereign, all omniscient, omnipotent, all and all and all and all is the one that Isaiah said, here is your God. Behold, hallelujah, that is our God. 3.45, I just made it in on time. I'll close this in a word of prayer and then we'll open the, the mics for comments. I hope it's lifted your spirits. I hope it's encouraged your hearts. I hope whatever trial you're facing now has shrunk to nothing because nothing can separate you from the love of your God. And if you don't have that trial now, the next time one comes, remember, run into Isaiah 40. Comfort ye, my people. How do we comfort it? Here is our God. Elohim Haiti. Most high God, Yeshua, Jesus, our shepherd who loves us so, oh Lord God, thank you. That doesn't even begin to say it's well up in our hearts, Lord. Appreciation of you, our mighty God, that you look tenderly, lovingly, and care for this mere speck of dust, this little human being called Michelle everyone who puts their own name in there, that you love unconditionally, that you meet every need with your resources, with who you are, with your attributes and your greatness. Lord God, keep our focus on you. Keep our eyes seeing you, our ears hearing your word, our hearts receiving. Lord, pour it in till it's very part of us, that we will be the shadow who you are, that it will glorify you, 
that when we are in trials and tribulations, we will not have a pity party. We will not have our focus skewed, but we will see it clearly for what it is to strengthen us in the power of Almighty God. Thank you for loving us so. Thank you for unconditional covenants. Thank you that you give this to Israel, that we can apply, that we know that your word is faithful to Israel. Lord, let her hear it. Let her know the God who loves her so. And use us to tell her, to show her the love as you extend it to us that we might comfort others. Let it bring all praise and all glory to your holy name. We pray in that precious, strong, healing name, the God of all hope, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Yisach, and Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of me too. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs>